Um, today I have uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Rene Flores, um, who is a new bar of family assistant of, a professor of sociology at the University of Chicago. His research interests are in the field of international migration, race, and ethnicity, and social stratification. And his research um, explores the emergence of social boundaries among immigrants and racial minorities across the world as well as how these boundaries contribute to the reproduction of ethnicity and social based inequality. Um, he has published in many peer reviewed journals, um, American Journal of Sociology, ASR, Social Forces and Social Problems. Um, uh, please welcome me in, uh, um, welcome him <laughs> to uh, this brown bag as well as uh, his co-author Maria Vignal Loria. Uh, thank you all. Well, thank you, Andrea, for that very uh, warm introduction. And, and I'm very happy to be here in this demography uh, workshop. I was, I was, I was just saying uh, before that I, I, I was an undergrad at Berkeley, so I used to come to these talks. So, uh, and I, I remember like when speakers would come from out of campus, and I would like be um, uh, inspired by their research. Um, so it just feels like uh, homecoming in a certain sense. So this project is 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 um multi-year project is it's taken about five years and we can talk about some of the reasons why it's it's, it's taking um this, this amount of time it's a co-author project with uh, maria bigna who's here with us she's a doctoral student in sociology and demography at the university of washington uh joining us from rostock germany and also regina martinez who is an anthropologist at the school of anthropology in mexico city the so here's the puzzle for this question. This is this is a why type of paper. Why, uh, and that's the reason why one of the reasons why I found this this question pretty appealing um, when I started to work on this a few years back. Between the year, the, within 2000 and 2020, basically in the last 20 years, the self-identified indigenous population in Mexico has tripled. It went from about 6% of the population to about 20% in the last census. That's essentially a surplus population of about 20 million more indigenous folks. This happened in a context where uh, most scholars expected the opposite. They expected that because of increasing cultural stimulation, ethnicity was going to fade away. There's also a few material incentives to identify in a, as a minority in Mexico. With, they don't really have the affirmative action programs that you have in places like Brazil, for example. And, and there's also still pervasive social discrimination. Few incentives, discrimination. So why, why would you have this so-called ethnic explosion as has been referred to in the literature by scholars and policymakers? We don't really know. And we're trying to address this, this question with this paper. And we use interviews with census officials from Mexico. We use a demographic analysis, a projection analysis that Maria Bignau uh, she will describe more detail uh, later on. And we also use experimental methods to try to understand what explains this ethnic explosion. And there's three possible explanations that we identified. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about, I will tackle, you know, we'll tackle them one by one during this conversation. Just to give you a sense of what's at stake theoretically, we, we use the framing of uh, symbolic boundaries uh, there's a there's a, a sizable work in sociology of culture, right? And then to find symbolic boundaries as socially meaningful distinctions that people make to distinguish between categories, between people, uh, distinguish who's in, who's out of specific groups. And scholars have identified three different boundary processes. Boundary crossing, when you know a person crosses between from one category to another, in this case would be identifying in a different ethnic label. That would be an example of, of, of crossing. Boundary shifting and literally like a, a boundary that, that, that just expands or contracts, you know, affecting entire populations could be, uh, and that and boundary blurring, that means that the difference itself between two different populations becomes ambiguous, becomes actually hard to certain. So it's no longer clear who's on what side of this line. Uh, and scholars, including Christina Moore at Berkeley, they have identified national censuses as race-making institutions. When censuses uh, provide certain categories of identification, they create incentives for folks to identify in certain categories, providing opportunities to cross 
these boundaries or not. At the same time, it's really hard to identify these boundary processes empirically. This discussion has happened more at the level of, of theory, of theorizing, but it's really hard to actually empirically see these boundaries in practice. The, an, an example to that uh, of, somebody, uh, of somebody that actually did that is also Mary Loveman at Berkeley as well, that, that they found that the population that, that was categorized as white in Puerto Rico expanded pretty rapidly at the beginning of the 1900s. And they say that this, is an, this is a, was driven by boundary shifting, essentially like that the boundary defining who whites are expanded within the context of uh, the colonial intervention of the US that revalued or that gave more value to whiteness, right? So that's how they explain that. But that such explanation probably does not apply to Mexico because you know, there's, no, there's not a foreign intervention. And also the ethnic category that's involved, indigenous, is actually stigmatized, right? It's not valued like it was uh, with the case of whiteness in Puerto Rico. Just a very, very short description, very summary of uh, the history of indigenous people in Mexico. These are the native populations that lived in Mexico before uh, European settlement. We know that the, during the first 300 years of the colonial period, there was a population crash due to war, disease, harsh labor. Um, then Mexico was a very diverse uh, country. And then at some point uh, after independence from Spain, Mexican elites decide to create this national ideology to sort of assimilate folks into an idea of Mexicanness, right? Before people did not see themselves as part of Mexico, as Mexican. So they tried to create this national project uh, based on the idea of of a mestizo category, mestizo literally meaning mixed, mestizo, that's what it means. But they created this, this, this category that uh, according to them, uh, to, to be Mexican was to be mestizo and, and mestizo, uh, it, this was the, the, uh, the, 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 the superior race because it combined the best traits from Europeans and from Native Americans. This was a race of the future, a race that transcended, that transcended all the different limitations of the other races. So, and this was part of a national development project um, that, that included a, a series of policies to culturally assimilate indigenous folks and other minorities into this idea of mestizaje, right? Mexicans are mestizos. Fast forward, uh, uh, you know, the clock, and then we see that cultural assimilation did not fully assimilate a lot of indigenous folks. 1994, there was a big indigenous revolt, Zapatista revolt. Um, and this also signifies a turn from that old assimilationist mestizaje project that the Mexican government endorsed to ideas of multiculturalism, for, for ideas about respecting cultural differences, about respecting individuals' right to self-identify in whatever label they want, uh, giving some kind of political autonomy to indigenous folks. So there's been uh, essentially a change in Mexico's national ideology away from mestizaje into embracing multiculturalism, where people have, at least formally, the right of being different. Today, Mexico is, it's, uh, it's a really, people often talk about the Latin American model of race and ethnicity, but in reality, these countries are so different. Mexico really stands by itself. It's very different from the rest of Latin America. You have a situation where indigenous folks, there's this nostalgic recognition of the contributions of indigenous folks, especially in museums, in, 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 in political rhetoric. But at the same time, there's still generalized disdain and discrimination against indigenous folks. So, so it's a complex status that indigenous folks occupy. Um, the, the very symbol of the country is actually capturing the, the history of the Aztec empire, right? I mean, this is, I don't have time to go into that, this, but it, it really, the, the, uh, a lot of the symbols uh, of, of Mexico yeah, are really rooted in this Native American traditions. At the same time, there's clear examples of discrimination. Just to give you a very brief example of this, uh, Roma was, was a very successful movie made in Mexico about three years ago. It won multiple uh, Oscars, including Best Director, that portrayed this woman uh, who, who, who she's, she's essentially is, is an indigenous um, maid from the south of Mexico, Oaxaca, that travels to Mexico City to work in, in, a, in a middle-class family home. 
and and she became really famous she, she was a uh, profiled in in hollywood all over in europe as a, as a breakthrough actress nonetheless she there was this backlash in mexico about the fact that you had a woman of indigenous ancestry all of a sudden becoming very famous right and there's all this very tough racialized language of um, you know here's just one tweet saying like people very upset that she was being profiled as representing mexico right uh, as stepping out of her place so there's there's somebody here saying even if the monkey gets dressed in silk and and then the ending there is she's still a monkey right so this is really tough really hurtful language that kind of shows you that there's still that ambiguity that's still that tension about the proper role of indigenous folks right this continuing level of stigmatization the way indigeneity has been measured in mexico is complex uh it it went from being the, uh, conceived from in a biological way early in the history of, of the census to being considered a cultural condition right so it's primarily been defined in terms of language if you speak an indigenous language and there's about 52 different languages in mexico it's one of the most uh, ethnically diverse countries in the world, just really behind India in that sense. Uh, if you speak one of those, either you are one of the really handful of anthropologists that are linguistic anthropologists, but really you are, you know, you are considered to be an indigenous folk, an indigenous person. That's the way it, it is typically being uh, conceived in the census. The census captures indigenous language as a way to 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 classify folks as, as, as indigenous, and becoming mestizo, becoming becoming Mexican has been conceived as a social cultural process, not necessarily biological, especially in the last few decades, right? So here are the results from the census uh, in, in Mexico since the late 1800s to the 2000s, showing you the size of the indigenous population based on different criteria. For the most part, uh, and this is the, the light purple bar, it's been identified on the basis of language, so, so the census would, would, would have a, a question about, does this person speak an indigenous language? And then that person would be classified as indigenous, right? So you can see how the, 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 the percentage of indigenous folks uh, as defined by language has been shrinking, although in absolute numbers, they've actually been increasing. But And, and then what happened was that in the year 2000, because of all this multiculturalist turn that I described at the beginning, uh, the Mexican government, along with other governments in the region, recognized the right of individuals to self-identify. So they included for the first time a question on self-identity. You know, do you consider yourself indigenous? The year 2000, they asked that question for the first time, and about the same percentage of Mexicans who spoke an indigenous language also identified as indigenous. No surprise there, about 6%. This is a surprise. This is the ethnic explosion. 10 years later, they ask uh, Mexicans again about their identification, and all of a sudden, it more than doubled. It went from about 5% to close to 15% uh, of Mexicans who identified now as indigenous. That was completely unexpected. I've talked to uh, census officials, I've talked to different scholars, and they don't really, they, you know, they don't really know why. Some of the census officials told me, you know, we just got the data, we went to Congress, and everybody got really happy that we found more indigenous people, and they just clapped. They didn't ask any questions. That was it. Um, but the, the purpose of this paper is to try to see why is it that you see this huge increase all of a sudden. And, and we have these people who said, well, it could be driven by pure demographic growth, the fact that indigenous folks have higher levels of fertility. That could be explaining at least part of this of this growth could be a methodological artifact, but to this day, there's no definite explanation, and that's exactly where we're trying to intervene. So the first possible explanation could be that, well, this is just driven by pure natural demographic growth. And that's the first uh, 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 hypothesis that we test, and, and Maria Bignal, she will, she will uh, lead the discussion here for the following slides. Uh, thank you, Rene. Uh, and can you all hear me okay? Ah, cool. Uh, so yeah, the, the first explanation, demographic growth, um, we start by distinguishing natural and social sources of ethnic racial population growth, natural sources uh, or natural growth, obviously caused by uh, differential mortality, fertility and migration, and then social um, growth, 
uh, stemming from changes in individuals' um, uh, categorical membership, right? And so um, in Mexico, um, the fertility rate of indigenous women has historically been higher than non-indigenous women. Uh, in 1999, it was 4.2 versus 2.9. So a difference of 1.3, uh, right? And then also in the second part of that, of that period, we had um, much more return migration in Mexico. So it is plausible at least that um, indigenous population grew faster than the non-indigenous one. And so could explain some of these of this population growth. Uh, in order to know exactly how much is explained by demographic processes, we estimate this 10 year demographic projection of the people that identified as indigenous, that self-identified as indigenous in 2000. Um, we compare the estimates of our projection with the population that you know, was actually observed, actually enumerated in the 2010 census. And then obviously the difference between the projected and the enumerated in 2010 gives us this um, crude measure of changes in ethnic identity. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we estimate a cohort component um, projection uh, following the Preston et al method, method. And the cool thing about this projection is that it accounts for the differential exposure to mortality, fertility, and migration by age and sex groups, right? Um, and so it's a three-step process. Um, the first one, which sort of like deals with mortality, uh, we estimated the number of individuals in each uh, age and sex group that survived to 2010 using age and sex specific survival probabilities. Now, the probabilities that we used for this part, we uh, were the ones from the United Nations um, model life table for developing countries, which, as you know, are based on um, uh, life expectancy at birth and the life expectancy at birth for 2000, we got from the estimations from the Mexican National Population Council. Uh, and so we survived sort of like the population uh, to 2010. Uh, next, um, we, uh, for the fertility part, we calculated, calculated age specific fertility rates, which you can see sort of like happening right there in that table. And then with those rates, we estimated the number of births over the time interval, and then added those who survived to 2010. And then the third step, uh, which deals with migration, which is kind of like the, the trickiest part. Um, so we estimated the number of migrants based on age and sex specific um, migration rates or estimations for international migration during the 10 year uh, interval. And so what we did for that was the um, calculating these sex and age specific migration rates using the life table of survival method for the entirety of the Mexican population. Unfortunately, we couldn't really calculate different rates of migration for the indigenous and non-indigenous population. Um, and so you see also sort of like the head of the table, uh, what we did here. And then the fourth step really was sort of like putting all the parts together, right? Um, so we have the estimates of the individuals that survived to 2010. We added the survived female and male birds obtained with the a specific fertility rates, assuming the 1.05 male female sex ratio at birth. And then we applied the migration rates that we calculated with the uh, life table forward survival method. Uh, and again, you have the head of the, of the table for the projection here. This is uh, indigenous women um, with a different column for the, for the projection. And the last column right there, uh, which is what we're really interested in, uh, is the difference between observed and projected, the difference between our projection for 2010 and the enumerated population uh, in 2010, which is better represented in this next figure. Um, uh, according to our demographic projection, we um, expected to see a growth from 6.1 million to 7.37 uh, million uh, people of the, of the self-identified indigenous population. And what we saw was it grew from 6.1 million to 16.72 million. Uh, it's a surplus population of 9.36 uh, million. Um, and and th this means sort of like basically a conclusion of, of this first process is that demographic growth or demographic processes can really only explain 12% of that, of that uh, population growth that we saw from 2000 to 2010. Um, yeah, and so now we turn to other explanations, uh, social mechanisms for population growth. Renee, can I ask a, Maria and Renee, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, your method, you could also look at sort of percentage change 
for each age group? Do you have a sense of where this um, extra population is most concentrated? Oh, I mean, that would be really easy to just include another column. We didn't do that. Um, I guess like if we go to the previous slide or I can do that right now and just open the- I was the just panel. curious if you had looked at as, you know, who's contributing to it. But anyways, we can talk about it at the end too. Yeah, well, I can have the answer to the question at the end. <laughs> but, but, but one of the interesting facts is that, is that uh, this extra, this surplus population has certain traits, including mm -hmm. they're more likely to be uh, monolingual, like only speak Spanish. And they're more likely to be found around the highly developed uh, Mexico City area. Like, so, so these are mostly urban, mostly uh, in, in monolingual Spanish speakers. These highly are not- Also. I'm sorry? Education is also- And they're, they're more educated. So these are not um, traditional rural indigenous, uh, people who live in indigenous areas. That's why mm -hmm. some folks have talked about the so-called Zapatista effect that people uh, more advantaged folks may be identifying as indigenous as a, as a, as a political process of identification with uh, a popular social movement, right? And that's one of our explanations, yeah. But we'll, and, and, uh, but, but uh, continuing with, with uh, the, the paper, I mean, another uh, possible explanation could be the fact that Mexico against the uh, advice I mean, the most common advice in sociology is not, do not change your questions, right? Because <laughs> I mean, um, there'll be selection. And, and um, so the Mexican census changed is, its identification question between 2000 and 2010. And that creates a good opportunity for us to try to understand if that's what's, that's what's driving uh, these this huge changes in identification. And also keeping in mind that, it, that the indigenous population in Mexico is the largest across all Latin America, and also the one that reported the, the largest growth. So Mexico is a good study case to try to understand that. Um, here are the two different census questions from 2000, 2010. The first one asked, are you Nahuatl, Mayan, Zapotec, Mixtec, or from other indigenous group? These are the four largest Native American groups in Mexico, right? 2010, 10 years later, they changed the question to, according to your culture, do you consider yourself indigenous? Very different questions, right? Um, when I spoke with, with the census officials, they said, well, we don't really know for sure, but what we think is that this, 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 this um, reference to culture, it's what's driving this, this, this growth because it softens the question. More people feel like, they, they, that this, this is more appealing to them. And there's a whole literature in, in, in sociology about, uh, there's a whole debate about how to define culture, perhaps as a set of learned behaviors and ritual practices. The census itself in Mexico defined it as language, customs, values, and traditions. And essentially what we think is like this, the, the, essentially defines indigeneity, not as a racial or biological attribute, but as something that's changeable, a malleable cultural condition. And perhaps people feel like, well, culturally, sure, I am indigenous. This is not a racial condition, it's a cultural uh, condition. And, and I think I identify as such in that way, if you ask it in that way. To test this, we ran a door-to-door -door national representative survey experiment in March, 2016, with about 1,200 uh, respondents, adults. And we had uh, our, our, our survey administrators had handheld devices that would automatically uh, assign people to different experimental conditions to minimize human error. And here we didn't have a good idea of what effect sizes we're dealing with. We didn't know if we actually, this was, there was an experimental effect in, in switching the question. So we included only three conditions with about um, 400 respondents in each. The first condition we asked the 2000 census question. In the second condition, we asked the 2010 and in the, in, for condition three, we, we uh, replicated condition two, but we eliminated the reference to culture. We just asked, do you consider yourself indigenous? To try to see if that reference to culture actually made a difference in terms of identification patterns. And we find that it doesn't, it really doesn't. Here are the results on the right side. This is, we found that absolutely, if you randomly ask the 2010 question, you have about three times more indigenous folks in Mexico than in the US the 2000 question. But if you ask the 2010 question, 
without that phrase about culture, it doesn't really make a difference. Here are the two orange bars. It doesn't make a difference. It's about the same level of identification. So cultural doesn't make a difference. And here, this is that what, what essentially extended the time in the project because we realized we had to go back. If we really try, to, we're trying to understand this, this, this issue, we have to go back and do another national representative survey experiment. Uh, but here we're going to systematically vary every single aspect of this question that is theoretically meaningful to try to really get to the culprit of this, right? To try to get to the, to the, to the bottom of this. So we identify four different hypotheses, four different changes in these questions that could explain these changes in identification. The first one, culture, we already talked about. The second one is representation. There's another way in which these questions are different in the sense that the 2000 census question mentions four largest Native American groups. So, but as I mentioned before, there's dozens of different Native American groups in Mexico. Perhaps if you didn't hear that, that your, your, your ethnic label, um, you that probably that depressed levels of identification among minority in, uh, indigenous groups, right? Maybe that could explain uh, part of the reason why um, there's, there's a difference in identification levels. So here, in order to test that, we use uh, language and, and, and um, to try to see if this question depressed the identification of minority groups who did not see themselves uh, re uh, represented in this question. And the, we, we use the fact that the census captures both language and identity. And for language, they ask you like, okay, what's the, the, the indigenous language that you speak, right? So here we can see if language speakers of majority groups versus minority groups, they have different levels of identification on the identity question. And we find that actually it's about the same, that for some reason, both groups, the big groups and small groups, they don't like the 2000 census question, but they, they, but they like the 2000 census question a lot more about over 90% of them identify as indigenous. So really only about 2% of this growth between 2000 and 2010 is explained by, by, by these differences of identification by the, the size of your indigenous group. As I mentioned before, this is not where the action is. The action is with, the, with all these Spanish monolinguals, folks who only speak Spanish, who live in urban areas where more middle class, many of them start, they identify as indigenous when you ask them to do the 2010 question, right? Uh, about 9 million individuals. Okay, so we're getting somewhere here on this journey. So it's not culture, it's not being represented in the question itself. So we're down to two different hypotheses. One we refer to as essentialism. And the idea here is that the, the 2000 uh, question asks you, are you indigenous? Like, like it's an essential attribute. Are you, as opposed to 10 years later, the census asks, do you consider yourself? Which is a very different, we believe, a very different way of asking for ethnic belonging. Uh, are you versus do you consider yourself? Are you a Berkeley person versus do you consider yourself a Berkeley person, right? One, we believe it's, it's really signaling indigeneity as, as an, an essential attribute that is self-evident and that is easy to ascertain. You are something versus the 10 years later, we believe that this reflects a more individual, individual subjective and flexible type of ethnic belonging. So like I said before, we went back on the field, we, we, we uh, obtained funding again, and, and we did another national representative survey experiment applied door to door, also about 1200 respondents. These are all adults in Mexico. And we included multiple uh, 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 treatments in order to test these other two remaining hypotheses. Um, so here we modify the 2000 question, Instead of saying, are you Mayan Zapotec? We include the more suggestive, flexible language. Do you consider yourself, right? Coping that that would, that would lead to an increase in identification. And we did the same to the other question. Instead of asking, do you consider yourself indigenous? We ask, are you indigenous? Using more essentialist language, right? To see if that, that made a difference. This would seem like pretty subtle changes, but what we find is that they make a big difference actually. 
Uh, and this explains about 40% of the gap that we found using essentialist language. So this is the 2010 um, identification levels. When you switch that to, instead of saying, are you indigenous, when you, when you switch it to, when you, when you go from consider to are you, you have a big drop from about 49% to about 30%. That's about 40, 40 something percent of the gap that we find between these two questions. And we see a similar increase in, in, in the expected direction when you go from the more essentialist 2000 question to using more flexible, so, you know, uh, uh, and less essentialist language. Do you consider yourself? You also see an, a, a small increase that's statistically significant, but it goes in the direction that we would expect. So using essentialist language, that's one of the, the, the reasons why we see a big growth in the indigenous population. The last hypothesis that we have is that the 2000 census question makes a reference to groups. It identifies indigeneity as a group condition, as a collective condition. Are you part of an indigenous group? Are supposed to, do you consider yourself indigenous without a reference to any kind of collective belonging, any kind of membership to a larger group? And as we know in the literature, in sociology, uh, uh, scholars like Brubaker, they say that groupness is, is just a very special case of ethnicity. It, it typically doesn't happen. People can feel that they're part of, you know, they, they, they can identify with an ethnic label. This doesn't mean that they see themselves as part of an ethnic group. Groupness is rare. It, it happens sometimes, but, it, but it often it doesn't actually happen. So the question here is, did, it, did, did this reference to groupness depress levels of identification? when it is added. So we did the same thing. We modified both questions to either talk about indigeneity as a group condition or as an individual condition. And we find that, yep, that's the other element that explains another 40% of the gap between, between both questions. When you go from the, the, the regular 2010 question and when you ask that question as, as a group condition, when you say, do you see, are you part of an indigenous group? you see a big reduction in levels of identification from about 49% to about 33%. That, that's a pretty big gap that explains the other 40%. It doesn't make a, a much difference here when we, go, when we start from the 2000 uh, question, but we definitely find evidence for the other, the other side. So we find that those two elements are actually what's driving the different levels of identification. So we would really like hounds trying to, to, trying to understand what is it about this question that drives people to, to, to really identify it as an ethnic minority? But there's more. <laughs> the journey is not over. We find evidence that um, the proportion of in Mexicans who identify as indigenous has continued to change, even when the question used by the census has not changed anymore. So, so there's, there's, there's a portion of growth, especially after the 2010 period, that is not driven anymore by changes in the identification question. And here's uh, the latest census from 2020. Uh, at the very top, we see that Me Mexico used the same question. They reapplied it 10 years later, this time without making significant changes. And now it went from 14, 15% to about 20% of the Mexican population that now identify as indigenous. So, indigeneity has continued to grow, to grow. And we think that this essentially signals two different types of ethnic boundary crossing. We, we basically identify two different types. These are this more theoretical contribution. We think that we need to separate, we need to distinguish as scholars between uh, what we call transitory boundary, cr boundary crossing. And these are motivated by, by small changes in questions, by incentives, by somebody saying like, oh, there's a, the, an affirmative action program. There's, you know, they're finding indigeneity in a different way on a survey. That leads to this boundary crossing that is transitory, that is short-term, that signals a shallow type of ethnicity. And we think that this will probably result in a low level of, of a low likelihood of political mobilization, right? If this is a, this is a really short-term, shallow type of ethnic belonging versus durable, which is another type of boundary crossing that we identify, that we think this has been shaped by um, ethnic social movements, in this case, the indigenous movement in Mexico, and also by government policies that are shaping the meaning of, of what it means to be indigenous. 
that's what we think is going on. The meaning of indigeneity itself is in flux. What it means to be indigenous as a result of these processes, these macro forces, we think that this could actually result in a potentially higher levels of mobilization. Just to give an example of, of, of the government policies that we have in place, there's been, like as I mentioned before at the beginning, a pretty drastic change in terms of the government policies towards, towards ethnic difference. If you see here a social science book from 1972, if you did public, if you did, if you did any kind of schooling in Mexico, you probably read this, this, this official textbooks and they describe, um, this guy, they describe the, the founding of Mexico. Uh, you know, it was formed by the mixing of Indians, Spaniards, and South African slaves. This kind of new culture was formed and the, new, and the Mexican nation was formed. Little by little, Mexicans realized they were as different from the Spaniards as they were from the Indians. Essentially, true Mexicans are mestizos. They're not either Europeans, they're not Indians, they're something else. So this communicates a normative uh, basis for, 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 you know, for, for, for this mestizo identity, right? To be Mexican was to be mestizo. Compare that to 40 years later, after multiculturalism, now the language that's included in the same social sciences book is Mexico is a multicultural nation sustained by its indigenous peoples. We recognize plurality. This is an intercultural nation. We respect the right of, to, you know, to be different. We, you know, we cherish diversity. No longer pressure to conform, no longer pressure to become mestizo, to be, to be uh, Mexican. So we think that this could be opening some uh, opportunities for folks to identify in other um, identities that are not mestizo, right? And also there's been ethnic activism here. Uh, you know, the, the indigenous movement has played a big role in, in revaluing these categories, in, in really bringing awareness to the plight of indigenous folks, perhaps creating more and more identification with these labels. So in conclusion, we essentially identify that natural demographic growth can only explain about 12% of these um, big, essentially the tripling of the indigenous population in Mexico. We, instead, we identify two different types of boundary crossing. What we call the transitory crossing that was triggered by specific changes in the identification question in the census. And one of our contributions is that we actually are able to, 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 to understand precisely what changes in the phrasing produce these results. This could have implications beyond the Mexican case. The indigenous population uh, throughout Latin America is, is being in flux in multiple countries, right? Some of these countries have changed their identification question in the same, using similar changes as Mexico. So we can see, okay, if you use a more essentialist language, we, we, we should expect a decrease in, in levels of identification. If we refer to indigenous folks as a group, we should expect also a decrease in the levels of identification. Um, I, I, and, and beyond that, we also identify that there might be a different type of boundary crossing, which we call durable, that, that, that is really about a shift in the meaning of indigeneity. And I think here we need more research, particularly qualitative research, to try to understand how the people in Mexico and Latin America define these ethnic labels. What do they mean to them? What does it mean that to, to identify as indigenous uh, for different kinds of folks who live in different contexts? I think we need more of that rich qualitative research in order to understand that. And um, the last point we want to make is that seemingly small changes to ethnic or racial questions, just dropping one, one single term, group, can actually lead to a very large qualitative and quantitative change in the in the in you know in the character of the minority populations that you try to identify. So that's all, and uh, we uh, we want to thank all the different scholars who have given us feedback, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Maria and Renee. That was a wonderful talk. Um, so I'm going to call on. We have a few questions, I think, in the chat. If other folks have questions. Um, please feel free to put it in the chat or you can also um, raise your hand or, or unmute and just talk. So um, Ron has a, has a question and I'll, and I'll let um, Ron unmute and, and ask his question. We still have Ron on the line? 
maybe I'll ask Ron's question on his behalf. So Ron says in the chat, similar things have happened in the US in recent decades. Um, Mike Couch and Josh Goldstein have a paper on this topic. And he says that um, the Irish population grew unexpectedly in the US. It seemed to turn on trends in popularity of different ethnic ethnicities leading to different people choosing to classify themselves as one or another, even if they only had a small share of ancestry in the country of origin. Um, Ron says that he also thinks that there was a similar great increase in size of Native American populations in the US, perhaps some because of the casinos and sudden riches, but also because it became more popular. Um, so I guess Ron doesn't have a, a, an explicit question, but but do you? Uh, do you oh, there, Ron's here. I am Hi, here. <laughs> I, let me just add one sentence there because I Googled this for a, a little bit in the talk. Um, so there's a literature going back at least to the 1970s on these um, sort of rapid changes in identification as American Indian or Native American on, in the census. Um, and generally, I, I, they, I didn't see anything about changes in the wording of the question, but my the sense I got was that this had more to do with, I don't know, I used the word popularity, but the way belonging to an ethnic group was viewed uh, sort of in a trendy cultural sense. Was it viewed as being romantic and glamorous to be of Native American uh, origin, uh, or was it viewed as the opposite? And uh, changes of that sort. In any event, there is a bit of a literature, but probably you know all that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, that was our, our point of departure, uh, precisely that literature about the, you mentioned uh, Michael Hout about the, the growth of the Irish population that goes beyond what purely natural demographic processes would, would predict, but also the Native American uh, population, right? That you, you basically saw an explosion uh, Matthew Snape at Stanford, right, has worked on this question and essentially identifying that probably the India movement, uh, that the Red Power movement in the U.S. Um, in the 60s and 70s probably helped to destigmatize this identity. Uh, it made them more palatable, palatable for folks to identify as, as, as Native American. And also there was this um, financial incentives to some degree in some areas um, that may have prompted um, more folks to identify. So that was definitely, you know, that, 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 that was part of the, the, the conversation we we're having. Uh, and, they, and, and I think the stigma part is, is probably plays a role here in the sense that there is the indigenous movement in Mexico, I think has played a similar role in trying to, uh, in, in, in increasing consciousness about the plight of the Native Americans in Mexico, about understanding their history, their struggle, uh, increasing levels of sympathy. Uh, towards towards uh, indigenous people, right? What what's interesting? So I think that's definitely part of the, the 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 response here, part of the part of the question. The interesting thing is that this has happened without having clear incentives. There's very limited incentives in Mexico to yeah. self-identification as indigenous. There is uh, very limited cases, such as in some universities, when you apply, there's extra consideration if you are indigenous. But, but there's really nothing really widespread. So, uh, but, but we, we believe that the part about the stigma and the indigenous movement part that we think that is definitely part of the puzzle. But I think we need more qualitative research to try to be, get on the ground and understand how, how folks are, um, are, are talking about this. I just give you a quote here that we, um, from, so this, this woman here, she was the, this is from the Yucatan state, um, Yucatan Peninsula. She was named uh, indigenous governor, which is a symbolic position uh, in that state, and, and uh, in 2019. So there were some observers that, that questioned her indigeneity, right? And she says, no, I am indigenous. I may not look like one. I may not have a Mayan last name, but what matters is fighting for indigenous rights. So here we see some qualitative evidence that it's really about this political, political sympathy, right? It's, it's about the struggle for for, for, for collective rights, not necessarily ancestry features or, or, or family, family uh, traits. Thanks, Renee. Um, so the next question is from Ethan Sherrigan. Ethan, do you want to 
unmute and ask your question. Sure, I can try. Um, the question was uh, about the role played by genetic testing. So there have been uh, a number of papers in, in recent years uh, that have correlated the change in, in ethnic identification in the US with uh, genetic testing, like ancestry.com type stuff. Um, just curious if, that, if that's also a phenomenon in, in Mexico and if it has any role to play in, in the way in some of these changes that you found. That's a really inter interesting question, Ethan. That's definitely the work of somebody like Wendy Roth, right? This has been working on trying to understand the impact of taking an ancestry test on how people identify. And the issue with Mexico, though, is that it has been more limited because companies like 23andMe, for example, do not ship uh, down there. So, so just access to these tests are definitely, um, it's more limited. But, but I feel like as, um, we can definitely explore that within the Mexican American population. For example, the largest growth, the, 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 the group that, that is growing the, the, the most uh, within Native American population in the US are indigenous from Mexico, right? I mean, or, or like, I don't know how to call that, like Native Americans from Mexico. They're, they're, the, they're the group that is contributing to, 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 to this growth in the Native American population particularly as the census in the US changed the labels a little bit of the Native American label. And now it, it basically specifies too that you have to have some kind of a connection, not only to US groups, but also to Latin American indigenous groups. So maybe this, this label has become more and more appealing. Um, so, so I imagine that there will be more, more changes in the future, but, but the DNA part, I think it's still pretty, preliminary in Latin America, because there's still not full access to that. Particularly also in those years, um, I think if we if we see an effect would be and it would be really interesting. Um, but as far as 2000 in that period. Um, yeah. OK, we're getting close to the end of time. Let's do a couple more questions. Leora, do you want to ask your question? No, I'll let someone else ask. I mean, it's fine. Okay, Renee, we can also share these um, questions in the chat with you for later. There's comments as well. Um, Ken, do you want to ask yours? Well, I wondered on the demographic side, if you've done any modeling of intermarriage rates, it doesn't take too much intermarriage to expand the portion of individuals who have some perhaps small indigenous ancestry. <laughs> We, we haven't modeled intermarriage, um, but I think it was at one point when we were exploring sort of like the demographic question, um, something that we wanted to do. Also just remembering that uh, I just had your question. Uh, well, I'll talk about that later, but no, Ken, uh, but that's, that's, not a, that's a great suggestion to see how, um, how modeling intermarriage rates could, we could see sort of like increasing in the partners that are non-indigenous if, if intermarriage has increased. Um, and just back to, to, to sort of like who is identifying more, maybe not surprisingly, it is younger people. The age group that increased the most was the 10 to 14 in 2000, who is like 20 to 24. So, um, so that's interesting, but all sort of like younger age groups, uh, we see sort of like a higher uh, percentage of, of the difference that can't be explained. Which is interesting because it could go along with this idea of uh, like political consciousness, right? Like younger people tend to be more, at least in the literature, right? More open to change, more more flexible. So they are, they they may be exposed to certain ideas and maybe more likely to to change their identities as a result of that. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. It could also be, I mean, if it's young parents with young children, um, if if parents are answering some of those questions for children, it'd be interesting to see the how parents are identifying their their children yeah Th that was actually something that for the projection for example the young children are not even asked that question and so we just sort of like um assume the ethnicity of the mother and then for the birds we since we did a female dominant projection we assigned the birds to the ethnicity of the mother um which as well you know research in mexico mexico has suggested that kids kind of like take on the ethnic identification of the mother rather than the, than the father, but that's also related to intermarriage, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. So we are actually over time. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I will, I will share them with, with Renee. And um, I think um, Renee has very kindly agreed to stay on for 15 minutes to chat with the 
students. So, so I want to end in time to make sure they have um, enough time. So, 